Welcome to this edition of AFMC. I'll tell you how I got better. I'm glad to be here. But a mission to deliver it. Well, I think that we're, we're talking, we're going to talk about everybody's. Arkansas is the second highest prescriber. Welcome to this episode of AFMC TV. I'm Robin Ledbetter. Thank you for joining us. Today I have with me Chris Collier, and he is the Executive Director of the Arkansas Prostate Cancer Foundation. Chris, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate it. So tell us about the foundation first. What is the work that you guys do? Sure. Uh, we are 23 years young at this point, uh, based in Little Rock. Uh, we are indeed a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, and everything we do uh, is free of charge for men and their families here in the state of Arkansas. We provide uh, educational outreach to educate folks about prostate cancer, what it is, you know, what to look for, et cetera. Uh, we provide free screenings for men to try to uh, you know, help with early detection. Uh, if indeed a man uh, does have prostate cancer, we provide one-on-one -on -one patient navigation services, so we try to help uh, men and their families with resources. That might be emotional resources, it might be financial resources, but we're there to help with all those things. Uh, additionally, we've got uh, peer group meetings that we provide monthly. So men that are newly diagnosed can meet with men that have, that have already gone through this and gives them kind of a, of a private setting uh, to be able to address that. And I guess the final thing we do is provide uh, actual financial resources. So if a man has uh, an extended uh, track they have to make for treatment. We can provide gas cars, we can provide uh, overnight lodging. Uh, we can even provide, uh, in some cases, direct payment to providers. So we can help with co-pays or deductibles or, or whatever the case may be. And tell me about the patient access to care program too. Yes, so, and, and that's the last thing I just mentioned. So, so that program is designed, and, it, and I'm real proud of that, it's something we started just two years ago. That's designed to help those families that truly need financial assistance. So uh, the, the, the truth is there are so few urologists in the state of Arkansas that actually treat prostate cancer. So if you're located in some of the outer reaches or if you're in the Delta or some of the other portions of the state, there's a very uh, likely possibility you're gonna be driving two, three hours you know, for treatment or for appointments or whatever. So the first part of that, that uh, patient assistance program is essentially we provide gas cards to help you get to and from appointments. Um, if you're going to be doing prolonged treatments, we'll, we'll, we can help with lodging, uh, knowing that you might be somewhere for multiple nights. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll also make direct payments to providers. So we, we can pay you know, physicians or clinics or hospitals or whatever the case may be, uh, try to help with the deductibles or the co-pays or, or whatever, just to help men that, that could use that extra financial assistance. So tell me what healthcare providers should tell their patients about prostate screenings. That's a great question. And I'll tell you, it's, it's a bit of a, uh, of a mixed bag. So, you know, the, the reality is in about 2012, uh, there was a national, uh, agency that recommended that there was over treatment of prostate cancer and that physicians, pr primarily uh, your uh, family care providers, you know, your primary care physicians, uh, should consider either not screening or screening on a much more limited basis. And they recommended screening only men uh, basically ages 55 to 69, so pretty narrow bandwidth on age. Uh, and, and many doctors did that. So you fast forward now some 11 years to where we are today, and unfortunately, uh, and keep in mind, I said that was 2012. So since 2014, new prostate cancer diagnoses in this country have gone up over 3% a year annually. Late stage diagnosis, meaning stage three or four, uh, has gone up 5% annually. So I don't think it's a mystery that the fact that you had an agency come out and make that recommendation and people quit screening uh, is a direct correlation to now we've got, we've got higher cases. So, so for me, the message to healthcare providers is please screen men. I mean, if, if you've got a man coming in for a physical or an annual checkup, you're gonna be doing blood work anyway. So all we're saying is do that one little extra amount because that initial test is nothing more than a tube of blood out of your arm. Right, and you're already there, and you're already having blood work done. T 
take the initiative to provide that one extra test. So it's not just a physical exam for the screen. It's it's not. I mean, now it can be. I mean, there there is a physical exam, which is called the digital rectal exam. It's a DRE is the acronym for it. Typically speaking, uh, you know, most doctors would not do that initially. I think they would do that uh, as kind of the next step in the exam phase, if you will. Some doctors will do it in the course of an annual physical. And so, again, if you're going to do the physical, draw the blood, you can do the DRE as well, and, and you can maybe have an even bigger comfort level as to where you are as it relates to prostate cancer. But, uh, but again, the initial exam truly is, is that blood draw. And then if that comes back elevated, uh, I would say a typical course of action is there might be a second blood draw just to make sure you know, there wasn't a false reading on the first one. Uh, if the second one were to come in elevated as well, I think that's when you would get to the DRE, and I think that's when you would then get uh, potentially to an MRI or a biopsy and those next steps for, for treatment. And what are s studies showing that the, the primary age should be to start screenings? You mentioned a little bit about that delay. Is, right. is that the case now? I, I think it's getting better. We've, we've started to see uh, various organizations uh, around the country somewhat soften their stance, if you will. Um, we uh, take the stance that men aged 45 to 70 ought to be screened, uh, unless you're high risk. And if you're high risk, we'd say as early as age 40. Um, and, and I can take a quick minute, if it's okay, to talk about what high risk is, just so people know. Uh, there, there are several things that we would say would put you in a high risk category. Uh, the first would be if you've had prostate cancer that runs in your family. So a father, a grandfather, an uncle, or whatever, you're a little more likely to get the disease. Uh, of course, if you're older, the older we get, the more likely we are to get it. If you're African-American, uh, African-American are, are at least two to three times more likely to get prostate cancer than Caucasian men. Uh, if you were a firefighter or served in the military, if you had exposure to things like Agent Orange, it's been shown that that could contribute to prostate cancer. And then finally, the fifth one, which surprises many people, if you've had breast cancer run in your family, you know, a mother or grandmother or something like that, um, there is a gene uh, called the BRCA gene that you might, you know, carry that would actually elevate your risk level for prostate cancer. So any of those five categories, we would tell you you should consider being screened as early as 40. And is, is catching it early the key? Is, is it about prevention? It, it is, because it's, and, and, and that's true with so many cancers, right? I mean, I, you hear that all the time, but, it, but it's so true. If, if you catch it early, uh, it greatly enhances your treatment options. It greatly enhances uh, your, your survivability. Uh, and, and it just makes for uh, a much more positive overall treatment experience. If, if you catch it late, and, and like I say, we, we've seen this, the surge, if you will, in stage three and stage four diagnosis. And, and I don't think it's a secret because again, so many men have gone through a period where they weren't getting screened. That's not all the doctors, by the way. I mean, men just aren't good about going and getting screened. And so the fact that they haven't, uh, it, it's not surprising we're seeing more late stage development. And it, well, we don't hear a lot about it. We hear a lot about breast cancer prevention, mammograms, women's health. Um, why is that? Why do you think we, there's not a lot of advocacy about it? I, I think there's several reasons. I, I think number one, and, and I, uh, I say this often, I mean, I applaud women, okay? Women uh, are the best at embracing uh, each other uh, and their health and, and, and taking the necessary steps to do the right thing, okay? so. Women, you know, are good about going to get mammograms and, and getting pap smears and going to see the urologist. And I do think there's this, though, which maybe we don't talk much about. Women get taught at an early age, and I don't really know what that age is. I'm going to guess 12 to 14, that they got to go to the doctor annually, right? Men, unless you get hurt playing a sport or something, you're not really told at an early age you need to go to the doctor. And so I do think there's an educational difference just in our cultures and, and, and all that that has that you know, contributed to some of that. Uh, but the other side of it is just as great as women are about embracing it and helping each other and you know, they'll wear pink and they'll throw parties and they'll really support each other, men don't want to talk about it. 
know, men don't want anybody to know they have it. They don't want to talk about side effects. They don't want to talk about repercussions. They don't want, I mean, they, 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 they feel like it threatens their manlyhood, if you will. Um, so I, I think there's several factors there that all contribute, but uh, I, my hope is we, we keep trying to break down the barriers with men to get more men to come forward, to talk about it, to share their experiences, uh, because it will save lives. I, I'll say this, but people ask me all the time, what are some uh, side, not, excuse me, not side effects, what are some symptoms of prostate cancer? I, I, I don't like talking about them, and the reason I don't is because it's documented that over 90% of men that get diagnosed with prostate cancer never have a symptom. So when, he, when I get up and speak and people press me on, well, come on now, tell us what the symptoms are. And then I'll go through some of them, and they're like, I'm fine, I don't have any of those. Well, most people never do. And the reality is, if you do, chances are, again, it, it's probably late in the game, and Etc. So let's talk about treatment. Have there been advancements within that, that area? There, there have, and, and there continue to be. Okay, I mean, it's, uh, I, I do think, I told someone just yesterday in, in a conversation that this sounds a little bit backhanded in a way, but I said, yeah, I'm so thankful that the American Cancer Society this year has elevated uh, the discourse on prostate cancer. And in their annual publication that they do every January, which is their year ahead forecast and so forth, uh, prostate cancer was actually the focal point of that publication this year. And I got to tell you, that, that hasn't happened in years and years. Uh, the, the negative of that is obviously the, the numbers are going the wrong way, and that's why they focused on it. But the positive is to have a national organization of that magnitude calling attention to it really helps. Uh, there are indeed a lot of new treatments coming about. Uh, we're pretty fortunate in a, in a place the size of Little Rock to have uh, the things that we do have available to us. Um, you've got a number of, of great clinics of urologists uh, around the city. Uh, you know, Arkansas Urology is statewide. CARTI uh, is certainly developing into to more of a statewide entity. UAMS obviously is statewide. They're all great organizations um, that provide many, many things, not the least of which is some of the newer radiation treatments. UAMS just unveiled their new proton uh, center, uh, I think last month. Uh, I've yet to see the, uh, I've been invited, hadn't made it over there yet, but I've yet to see exactly how that works. Uh, I've seen the, the diagrams and so forth on it. Uh, that's pretty extraordinary. And uh, a little while back, of course, car tie, uh, got their uh, cyber knife uh, procedure. So, the, and I have seen uh, that uh, firsthand. And so, the precision with which these, you know, this equipment and, and the way they can can take a laser and drill down to just the the most minute point uh, in an effort to both get all of the cancer as well as not harm any other portion of the body is. It's truly mind-boggling. So, and there's lots of other things on the horizon. In fact, there's things on the horizon trying to find other ways to test for prostate cancer uh, other than just the, the blood draw and, and having to have a biopsy. Uh, I would tell you one other thing I think is a huge development. You know, there are more and more geneticists out there. And so they're t starting to, to do a really great job of defining you know, what your family history looks like and how that contributes to you just like we talked earlier about, it might make you at an elevated risk. Well, they, they've put science behind that to really address what, what are you know, your risk factors and maybe what percentages are you looking at in terms of uh, your, your exposure, not just to prostate cancer, but to any number of potential illnesses. So before we go, let's talk a little bit about No Shave November. You know, it, it's an advocacy um, tool used for a lot of different um, fundraising events and different things, but you guys are using it for to raise awareness for prostate cancer in the foundation. Tell me a little bit about that. Sure, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I keep my beard year-round, but I, I don't shave quite as much during November uh, in support of it. Uh, it's a great way for us to raise awareness, right? I mean, again, it's... It's all about men, you know, it's, it's, it's cancer, unfortunately, that affects men. So we try to get men to uh, 
to embrace that by not shaving. There are a lot of men out there that have the opportunity not to have to shave for the month, right? And so we give them an excuse. Tell your wife, tell your significant other, hey, I'm doing this for a good cause, so don't be upset with me. I'm not going to shave this month. Um, we get them to get people to support them financially. We get them to, to maybe raise money on their own. Uh, a, a really new little twist this year is I've got five uh, high school football coaches competing around the state. Uh, so it, we just try to find ways to get men to step up to the plate, put down the razor, do it in the form of a good cause by calling both attention uh, to this tough cancer as well as raising money, which, which I will say, every dime we raise, not just no shave November, but throughout the year, every dime we raise through our foundation stays in Arkansas. I don't have to send a check to a national organization. I don't have to share those funds anywhere else. So that money stays right here. It allows us to do all those services we talked about at the top of the, uh, of the interview. Uh, all of which we provide free of charge. And so what should, if say a healthcare provider or community partner wants to get involved or they want to do screenings or advocacy education, what should they do? Great question. Uh, there's two or three things they can do. I mean, one, you can certainly call our office. You're welcome to call me, 501-379-8027. Uh, Give us a shameless plug there. Uh, so yeah, by all means, they can call and just say, hey, we're interested. Uh, they can go to our website, and I, I think we're going to provide a QR code maybe on the screen uh, that they can utilize. But they can go to our site. They can. Uh, there's a button at the top. If they want to donate money. You can donate. If you want uh, materials, we, we maintain a library at our office, both in English and Spanish, of countless uh, books, pamphlets, brochures on prostate cancer, all free. So if you need information, we can certainly provide that. If you want to partner with us, uh, to put on a screening in your community. We, we are constantly uh, looking for opportunities to get out. And again, we go statewide. So it doesn't matter where you are, please reach out to us. We'd love to partner with you. We'd love to come into your community. Uh, and again, those screenings are all free of charge to these men. So uh, many, many ways you can do that. And go to the website. Call us on the phone, whatever's easiest. Okay. Well, Chris, thank you. Thank you for talking to us today. Lots of really great information. And I hope that you raise lots of money for the month of November. Well, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you for having me, too. I very much enjoyed it. Of course. My pleasure. Well, that's it for this episode of AFMC TV. Thanks for watching and have a great day.